Hi, second graders. Welcome back to your TV classroom. Today is Friday, March 5th. Ah, we did it. We made it to the end of the week. You may have had a really great week. You may have had a week that felt not so great. Either of those things are okay. But you did it. You made it to the end of the week. Bravo. Way to go. Let's check in with our zones before we get going with our learning today. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, today, how are you feeling? What zone are you in? Are you feeling like you're just oh, kind of dragging or are you in a good mood and you're feeling like you are calm and happy and good to go? Are you feeling a little worried or frustrated or excited or are you really mad or feeling out of control? What zone are you in today? Mrs. Wally, what yes, zone Mr. are Kevin. you in? Well, hmm. That's a really good question, Mr. Kevin. I'm in a lot of zones. I'm having one of those days where I'm having a lot of feelings and a lot of them feel big. So I can't really decide what zone I'm in, which can feel kind of scary, but I know that feelings are okay. So I'm gonna tell myself, it's okay that I'm feeling that way. And maybe I need to do some hand breathing that will help me focus so that I can identify my zone. Would you like good. to do that with me, Mr. Kevin? I would love to. Friends, can you do some hand breathing with me today? Put your hand out. Here we go. Okay, now let's go back the other way. Man, I feel a lot better. And you know what? Even though I have some of those other feelings going on, I'm still in the green zone because I'm feeling okay and I'm feeling like I'm ready to learn. So I know I've got some of those other feelings going on, but they're not affecting how I'm feeling. Like the emotions are happening, but my mood is that I'm ready to learn. So I'm gonna say, Mr. Kevin, I'm in the green zone today. Excellent. What zone are you in? I'm in the green zone too, especially after we just did the hand breathing. Yeah, it really helped, yeah, didn't it's it? Yeah, like oxygen just Makes a difference. Yeah, it made my brain calm down. My brain was feeling really racy to begin with. I couldn't even figure out what zone I was in, and now I can. Amazing. Friends, make sure that you share your zone with someone at home, and make sure to ask them how they're feeling as well. It's Friday, so that means Fact Fun Friday. Let's see if we can figure out this fact. Are you ready? Hmm, what is 80 plus three plus two? Mr. Kevin, do you know what it is? I do. What is it? 85. How did you know that? Because I know that three and two is five. And if you add five and 80, 85. You, you get 85, fantastic. Hmm, 78 plus five. Well, if 80 plus five is 85, and 70 is two less than 80, then what's two less than 85? 83. See how when you think about numbers and their relationship to each other, you can figure out problems without having to actually add on the five from 78. Or you could have said 78 and two is 80 and three is 83. That I always go too. with that. The friends you were doing of 10. that? Yeah, friends of 10 strategy. Yeah, friends of 10. I love friends of 10. It's one of the best strategies. That's why we spend so much time in kindergarten and first grade learning our friends of 10. You will use it for the rest of your career in math. Hmm. 78 plus 15, if we know 78 plus five, we know 78 plus 15. We're just adding another 10. So what's 78 plus 15, friends? It's 93. I know that when I was in second grade and I saw a problem like this, my brain would shut down. It would feel really hard. My brain would go, nope, not gonna do it. Because I didn't have the strategies that you all are learning. But I now know that when I look at this, I can take what I know and then use that to help me figure out what I don't know. That's what math is all about. Okay, 78 plus 17. 
Think about what we know. We know 78 plus 15 is 93. And 15, and 17 is just two more. So it's 78 plus 17. Woo, wrong number, Mrs. Wally. Ooh, I wanted to go back. 78 plus 15 is 93. So we need two more. What is it going to be? 95. Very good. Okay. 78 plus 19. If 78 plus 17 is 95, what's 78 plus 19? 97. It's just two more. Man, we keep adding two. I wonder if that's a rule we could talk about for a pattern. Today we're learning strategies for solving subtraction problems that involve regrouping. We started this yesterday and we're gonna work on it more today. We're gonna go slow, we're gonna get through what we can, and if we need to double the lesson, we will. First of all, I need your help writing the missing numbers. It says 413 equals four hundreds, blank 10, three ones. If I have 413, let's build that with base 10 blocks. Mr. Kevin, can you show my whiteboard? So I have 400, there it is, 413, 10 and three, 413. Okay, awesome. So it says four hundreds, blank tens, and three ones. How many tens are in this number? One. So I'm going to write one. Wait a minute. The next one says four hundreds, zero tens, blank ones. Hmm. I wonder what they're wanting us to do. If it has to be 413. How can I make 413 and not have any groups of 10? Oh, Gus, because I remember Mrs. Walla yesterday, you can have one 10 or you can have 10 ones. Oh, so I'm gonna get 10 ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So I traded it, right? I still have 10, but now it's in ones. So how many ones do I have now? I had 10 and three, which is 13. I regrouped. I took the 10 and I regrouped it back to the ones. Now I have 13 ones. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of, I'm, keep, I'm gonna go back to this because it says three ones. So I've got 413. Now it says, three hundreds, blank tens, and three ones. Well, if I'm only gonna have three hundreds, then this, I have to do what? Oh, I have to break it apart into the tens. See how the tens, you can make, there's 10 tens in a group of 100. So I'm gonna get 10 tens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. We get 10 tens, here we go. I traded it, how many tens do I have now? I had 10 plus one more is 11. So 413 can also be three hundreds, 11 tens, and three ones. Isn't it helpful to have these base 10 blocks so you can see how the trading happens? Then you don't get lost and wonder what's going on. Okay, let's get going with our work today. That's the kind of thing we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be looking at equations and trying to subtract and saying, do I have enough in this place value to take this many away? If not, I'm gonna to need to borrow from the other place value, regroup those amounts into this place value and subtract. All right. Let's just read the problem together. First, we're just gonna read, that's all we're gonna do. At Brown School, could you get the whole screen, Mr. Kevin? At Brown School, there are 327 girls and 276 boys. How many more girls are there than boys? So what's happening in this problem? We've got a school and there are some boys and some girls. Okay. I'm gonna read the problem again and I want you to tell me, is this a problem where we have two parts in a whole or is this a problem where we have two parts and we're comparing? 
At Brown School, there are 327 girls and 276 boys. How many more girls are there than boys? Oh, uh-huh, Gus, yep. I saw it too, it said, how many more? This is going to be a comparing problem. So I'm going to draw a comparison bar model. Do you remember how to draw the comparison model? We make the top line larger, or the top rectangle, the bottom rectangle shorter, and then we have this part that's different that shows the more or the less part. So this is the kind of problem we're doing today. Now let's figure out where our question mark's gonna go. What are we trying to figure out? Are we trying to figure out how many in the top bar, the bottom bar, or the different part? At Brown School, there are 327 girls and 276 boys. How many more girls are there than boys? What's our question? What are we trying to figure out? Yeah, how many more girls are there than boys? When I'm trying to figure out how many more or how many fewer, where does that question mark go? Yeah, we put it right here in the part that's different. That's what we're trying to figure out. So now let's read and figure out where we're gonna put the information. At Brown School, there are 327 girls and 276 boys. What's the information we have to work with? 327 girls, 276 boys. We're trying to figure out how many girls and boys. No, we're trying to figure out how many more girls there are than boys. We're not trying to figure out how many all together. Now here's where it gets tricky. Which one's gonna go in which box? What do you think? Where's 327 gonna go? Where's 276 gonna go? Which box is girls, which box is boys, and why? Hmm. Mr. Kevin, what do you think? Hmm. Um, well, I'd say that uh, we know that the 327 girls, that's the bigger amount, right? Right, that's the greater amount. It has yeah. more to it. Yeah. So, so this, the top box the should top be the box girls. should be girls. And yeah. the bottom box should be boys because boys. it has less. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, yeah. so 327 people in this box mm -hmm. and 276 people in this box. Oh, friends, I'm gonna give you one minute. Write an equation and solve. Go ahead. Mr. Kevin, how long have we been going for? Oh, I mean our whole time. Thank you. Okay, friends, stop there. I'm gonna show you some ways that you could solve this problem. But before we do that, what equation did you write? Well, we have to think about what we know. We know this total bar, and we know what part of the bar is, we're trying to figure out what the part we don't know is. So that's a whole part part. And I know the whole, and I know one of the parts. So I can subtract. So I would write 327 minus 276 equals how many more girls there are, how many fewer boys there are, but we're answering how many more girls are there. So let's take a look at some ways you can solve that equation. You could use base 10 blocks. You could use the actual blocks or a drawing. Let's look at what they did. First, they built. What did they build? They built 
300, I'm gonna get my little laser pointer. They did 300, one, two, three, two tens for 20, and then seven ones. They did 327 equals 300 plus 20 plus seven. So they built that first. That's the starting number in our subtraction equation. Then they knew they needed to subtract because they're taking away 276. So they are gonna have enough ones to take away, so that's fine. But if they're taking away 70 from 20, they could not take seven away from just these two tens. So they said, oh, well I have 100, I can, I can get more tens by trading in. I'm gonna give them my 10, I call it going to the banker, give the banker my $100 bill, and they're gonna give me 10 back, 10 $10 bills, that's still 100. Equal trade, right? Not one 10 back. They're gonna give me 10, I want it to be the same amount. 10 tens is 100. So now we've got the 10 tens. Now we have a total of 12 tens. Then they started taking away. They took away six ones. They took away seven tens, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they took away two hundreds. And what did they have left? They have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, one left. So the answer would be there are 51 more girls than boys. Let's look at it another way. You could also, who did it on an open number line? Did anyone use a number line? I didn't learn about using number lines until I became a teacher. Isn't that crazy? I'm so glad that you get to learn about it. So let's look what they did. They did 276 plus that part we didn't know equals the total amount of girls. So we're looking for that part we don't know. So we started at 276 and they're counting how many hops it takes to get to 327. Well, four gets me to 280. 20 more hops gets me to 300. And then I can get to 320 with just 20 and then seven more. So then I have to add it all up. Well, 20 plus 20 is 40. 40 plus seven is 47. And 47 plus four is 51. Same answer. Let's compare the digits in each place in 327 and 276. Do you need to regroup to show more tens or more ones? Let's take a look. So I'm gonna do it here on my whiteboard. Mr. Kevin, if you can show my whiteboard. So we're, we've got 300 and 200, 20 and 70, seven and six. Now remember, if all of the ones on the left are greater, we don't have to regroup. But if any on the left are less, we're gonna have to regroup. So 300 and 200. Is 300 greater than 200 or less than 200? It's greater. Is 20 greater than 70 or less than 70? Less than, uh-oh, we're gonna need to do some regrouping here. Is seven greater than six or less than six? It's greater than six. Mr. Kevin, can I get my whiteboard back? It flipped back to the PowerPoint. It did, that's okay. So I know that I'm gonna need some help here. So if I'm in my tens place, where do I go for help? Well, my hundreds, so I'm not gonna have 300 anymore. I'm gonna have 200, and I'm gonna get to add 100 here. So I'm gonna have 120. Is 120 greater than 70? Oh yeah, it is, right? So 200 and 200, nothing left. 120 minus 70, 50 left, seven minus, Six, one left, and look, I get 51. How cool is that? That's what they did on this next slide. So go ahead and look at the full slide again, Mr. Kevin. I'm gonna get my pen. And take a look at this bottom part. We're subtracting here. So we do seven minus six is, whoop, I don't have my pen on. Seven minus six is one. And then 20 minus 70, we couldn't do. So we borrowed from the 300 and now it's 200. And now the 20 is 120. And 120 minus 70 is 50. That's what we just did on the whiteboard. And we know our answer is 51. Same as what we got with the number line, same as what we got with the base 10 blocks. We're gonna stop there for today, friends. We will continue on next time. 
So we're not going to have an assignment today, and that's okay. Happy Friday, no assignment. I want to make sure that we get through those lessons and do a few of them together before I have you work independently on that on your own. So today we started learning strategies for solving subtraction problems that involve regrouping. We identified the value of each number. We use strategies to subtract. We use place value blocks. We use place value drawings. We use open number lines and we use pulling it apart into the place values to help us find a solution. And we checked our work by using multiple ways to check that they were all the same answer. Next time when we meet, we're gonna continue doing this work and I'm gonna let you do more of it on your own and then you'll get to practice on your own. Mr. Kevin, if they have a question, can you tell us how they can contact us here at the TV Classroom? Second graders, please send your questions to tvclassroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us. Ask your adult if you need some assistance. You can also send us something in the mail, like a drawing or whatever you want. TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. All right, friends. Now it's time for your break. Up next will be Ms. Oslin. Make sure to get your ELA packet and all your ELA materials for your lesson with her. Take your break, take care of your needs, and be back when she's on the screen ready to learn. Okay, friends, I hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you next time. Bye. Rules. One, you have 10 seconds to pick your crewmate. Two, a new timer will appear with an exercise for the crewmate you picked. Three, you will get 10 points for each correct crewmate and exercise you choose. Four, if you pick the imposter, you will lose all your points. Five, see how many points you can get. Good luck.
Hi, second graders. Welcome back from your break. Excellent job gathering your materials and being ready for our, our lesson. You can take your ELA packet, your pencil, and put those off to the side, but go ahead and hold on to your learning buddy if they are going to help you focus today. Now, we have been learning all about features of narrative writing. This is a graphic organizer that you have in, or a chart, excuse me, it's not a graphic organizer, it's a chart, um, that you have in your ELA packet. And it's gonna tell you what we notice about personal narratives. It's gonna provide an example, and then it's going to list all of the books that we can read or that we will read here in TV Classroom that are personal narratives. Now, you'll remember that a personal narrative is a type of fiction, it comes from our author's imagination, but it's often something from their real life that they turn into a story. So we notice about personal narratives is that it tells a story from someone's life. It can be written over various periods of time. It can be over just a couple hours. It can be a week. It could be months. It could be years. The author shares something important with the reader, like it could be traditions or how they grew up or how they learned. Uh, memories or a shared human feeling so that you and I feel connected to our author. The author uses really descriptive language, often including things about our senses, what they saw, what they smelled, what they taste, what they heard, or what they felt. And they might use comparisons like using a simile. You'll remember we talked a lot about that when we read the book Fireflies. And that helps you and I as a reader picture what it is that our author saw or smelled or felt or heard. Many stories have illustrations and the author might write from what's called the first person, which means they would tell their story using the words I, me, or my. And the author might write from the third person, meaning they would use words like they, he, or she. So today we're gonna learn to deepen our understanding of the chronological structure of narratives. Chronological structure means they go in order of events that they actually happened, just like beginning, middle, end, right? First, next, then, last. And personal narratives, you'll remember from our chart, can take place over a few minutes, an hour, a few days, or even a few years. And we're gonna read this book today called My Abuelita. It's written by Tony Johnston and illustrated by Yuyi Morales. And what I'm gonna do is read to you the dedication, which is what the author and illustrator said. We wrote this book for, hmm, usually someone who has inspired them. And I'm also gonna read the about the author blurb to get a little bit more of an understanding of why our author wrote this book and who they are as a person. So let's start with the dedication. Our author dedicated my abuelita to, it says, for storytellers everywhere. <gasps> That's you and I. We are storytellers. They wrote this book for us. Our illustrator said for the abuelas, the grandmothers of all shapes and colors who open their arms to love a child with all their corazon. My goodness, that must mean all their heart, probably. Now let's read about our author. Tony Johnston has long told stories from the, in the form of poems, picture books, and novels. She's written numerous children's books flavored with Spanish words and Mexican themes inspired by this year she spent living in Mexico. Mr. Kevin, do you have a translation for me? I do. Corazon is passion. Passion. Okay, I'm going to go or back. Heart. Now that I know. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Kevin. Mr. Mm -hmm. Kevin always takes care of me and looks things up for me. Um, for the abuelas, the grandmothers of all shapes and colors who open their arms to love a child with all their passion. Oh, I like that. Um, so Toni Johnston, her other books include That Summer, illustrated by Barry Mosier, and the comic novel The Spoon in the Bathroom Wall. She lives in San Marino, California. So our author spent some years living in Mexico, and that has inspired her stories. That's so interesting. So, my abuelita. We know that Tony lived in Mexico, 
And we know that the word abuelita means grandmother in Spanish, which they speak in Mexico. Why do you think Tony might have chosen to write a story about a grandmother? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you're thinking. Well, Gus, I know that authors write personal narratives based on their, pers their own life experiences. So I wonder if our author, Tony, had a grandmother that she was close with and she wanted to tell that story. Tony's story talks about the relationship between a little boy, like you can see on the front cover there, and his abuelita as he watches her get ready for her very special job. And Tony's story takes place over one morning, but lots of exciting and fun things happen during that morning. So let's pay attention to the chronological structure of my abuelita. I live with my grandma and she lives with me. I call her abuelita. She is as old as the hills, she says, maybe older. Her hair is the color of salt. Her face is as crinkled as a dried chili, but that doesn't matter. She is my abuelita. I love her and she loves me. My abuelita also loves her work. So we're gonna learn about abuelita's work. We're gonna pay close attention to the really descriptive language. Let me reread that. And if you're comfortable enough to close your eyes, do that. If you're not comfortable, just leave them open. But Picture this in your mind, visualize it. She says she is as old as the hills, maybe older. Her hair is the color of salt. Her face is as crinkled as a dried chili. Can you picture that? And we're able to do that because our author, Tony, has given us such descriptive language. Each day she wakes up with the sun. She stretches this way and that with her cat named Frida Kahlo and with me lingering, limbering up for work. She does knee bends and breathes deep, oh deep, like a big salty whale out at sea. I do the same. Frida Kahlo is already limber, so she tilts her head this way and that watching Abuelita and me. Okay, remember, we're paying attention to the, sto the chronological story. So first they wake up, and then each day she wakes up with the sun, she stretches this way and that. My abuelita is round, robust, she says, like a calabaza, a pumpkin. She doesn't mind, she likes pumpkins. Being round gives me a good round voice, she tells me, just the voice for my work. More descriptive language there. After she stretches, my abuelita takes a shower. While the water splashes, she sings way down in her throat, deep, boggy, froggy notes that stretch her voice for work. I, isn't it thrilling to sing like a frog, she asks me. I sing deep and boggy, froggy notes, glub, 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 it is very thrilling. So following the chronological structure, first she wakes up, then she does her stretches. After she stretches, my abuelita takes a shower. Then there's a word that authors use to give us a clue that it's the next event. Then, my abuelita wraps herself in a towel striped with black and yellow. She looks like a great big bee. While she dries, she hums like a great big bee, getting ready for work. I hum too, for fun. Abuelita puts on her fuzzy robe and prepares breakfast. Fresh orange juice, queso, cheese, warm tortillas she has made by hand, and huevos estrellados, starry eggs. 
That is fried. When she cooks, she yodels about bedrooms, she yodels about bedroom slippers. Pant pantoufles, pantoufles, pantoufles. Yodeling loosens my voice, she explains, for work. I know that already. My abuelita says it every day, but I like to hear it anyway. So when they're done with their shower, time to make breakfast. Oh, I didn't change the picture. There you go. Now you see her pink fuzzy robe, don't you? Frida Kahlo also likes Pantoufles' song. She sings it too. She sings so nicely, Abuelita gives her a taste of starry eggs. Then I, I yodel. Pantoufles, Pantoufles, Pantoufles. I yodel so nicely, my Abuelita gives me eggs. I give some to Frida Kahlo. We yodel and yodel, oodles of yodels. Frida gets oodles of starry eggs. Abuelita is almost ready for work. Just one last thing, she tells me. What, I ask, even though I already know. Now, she whispers, comes my booming. I plug my ears just in time. Then my Abuelita booms out words loud and clear. She always says the words should be as round as dimes and as wild as blossoms blooming. There included quite a few similes there to really give us an idea, a clear picture of what her booming is like. She says the words should be as round as dimes and as wild as blossoms blooming. So a simile yeah. is, a simile is, can you explain it? What so is it? Saying what it's similar to. Oh. Right? Or simile, might be like simile. Similar. Yeah. Oh. So that you can picture it in your mind, right? So your voice should be as round as dimes and as wild as blossoms blooming. So I can picture wild blossoms blooming. So then you can see her voice coming out wild. Mm. What do you think the cat thinks about that? <laughs> it's like clinging to the back of the chair there. Or the curtains. Soon she stops. I, I feel a wild blossom blooming, my abuelita says. I must be ready for work. You're not ready, I say. What's missing, she asks, looking carefully, looking at herself carefully. Your clothes, I laugh. She's still in her fuzzy robe. I've, I've done that before. I almost left the house like in my slippers. I, I, I. I almost forgot my abuelita always says that. So now that her voice is warmed up, she's going to get dressed. Chronological order. She puts on a flowery gown and bright red shoes and a scarf like a cloud that flows down to the ground. Am I ready? You're not ready. What is missing? My abuelita asks Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo meows because she doesn't know. She just knows that she likes eggs that look like stars. Your things, I say. Abuelita's hands fly to her face. I, what would I do without you? She always says that too. We stuck, we stuff her Carcacha, her jalopy, with all the things she needs for work. That's her car, her jalopy, with all the things she needs for work. A temple with many, many skinny stairs, rustling stalks of maize, a magnificent plumed snake, a king and queen as brown as beans, a kalaka, skeleton, one sun, one moon, one feathered crown. Am I ready now? Si. Then, vamanos, let's go. Besitos. My abuelita blows kisses to Frida Kahlo. So do I. While she curls up in the sun, we drive to work. As we roll along, abuelita's cloud scarf billows behind. At last, we arrive at a big brick building. My abuelita swoops in. So do I. We love to swoop. Abuelita arranges her things, I help, she arranges herself, 
I help. Last of all, I crown her with a sweep of stars. Am I ready? My abuelita asks me. You're ready. So you'll remember this story takes place over the course of one morning as Abuelita is getting ready to go to work, right? They woke up, they did stretches, they took their shower, practiced her voice, had breakfast, packed the car. Oh, she got dressed in there somewhere. And now they're at the big brick building and the last thing to do to make her ready is I crown her with a sweep of stars. An audience crowds close, like many worms, it squirms around because it's an audience of girls and boys. My abuelita raises a hand and everyone sort of settles down. Then with words as wild as blossoms blooming, as round as dimes, she begins, once upon a time. When I am old and pumpkin shaped and my hair is the color of salt and my face is crinkled like a dried chili, I know that is what I want to be. A storyteller like my abuelita. Okay, so notice how the story ends with our character thinking about how when he gets older, he wants to be just like his abuelita, a storyteller. Very often, authors will end their stories with their big idea or thought, so their readers are left thinking too. What are you left thinking about? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy. Gus, I'm thinking about my grandma now too. And I remember when I was little, we used to go stay with her. And I remember her getting up in the morning and she had a velvet robe and she would make coffee and she would make me apple cider or hot chocolate. So I remember that we went through a series of events when I visited my grandmother too. Now, second graders, today we learned to deepen our understanding of the chronological structure of narratives. We thought about the order of events and we thought about the features of personal narratives. Now today your independent work is, a couple weeks ago I asked you to complete a where do my personal story ideas come from and you created a list of things that you can write about. Today your job is to go back and add more to this list and choose one idea that you can add to and write about in your writing notebook. Make sure when you tell your story that you have a chronological order of events. And you could send us your writing here at TV Classroom. We would love to learn about your story. Mr. Kevin, how can our second graders send us their stories? Sure, uh, if you need some help, you can ask your adult, but uh, you can also just email us to tvclassroom at tacoma.k12.wa.us, or you can pop it into the mail. TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405. We would love to read your story. Absolutely, I wonder if they could include some similes also to be really descriptive. Similes. All right, friends, now it's time for our affirmation. This is the time of the day when we say positive things about ourselves before you go off to do your independent work. And today, your affirmation is, my story matters. Practice saying that out loud with me. My story matters. Excellent job today, second graders. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you back here next time in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.